Hi, everyone. Good day. Um, Dr. Rita Okorafo, and I'll be taking you in the next four days through introduction to hydrogen fuel. This course is very basic and is very fundamental. Its aim is to equip whoever is participating in this course with basic and fundamental knowledge. And then afterwards, they can use, they can, you know, build upon the knowledge that will be acquired through this course to learn more complex ideas, okay? So in the next four days, what we're going to do, um, we will start by looking at introductory concepts to hydrogen. And then tomorrow, we will go into the different um, sources of hydrogen. Uh, we'll look into them in details, the processes, and you know output and then on the third day we'll look at hydrogen storage and transport different mechanisms in which we do that and then on the fourth day we will do a hydrogen safety um, look at hydrogen and safety risk and then do a final quiz that summarizes everything from the start of day one to day four if you have questions please put them in the q a session and then during certain um, pauses, as I teach a concept, I will go through the Q&A section to see if there are any questions to try to address them. The main takeaways for this course is to gain fundamental um, understanding. We'll look at the different applications and technologies, how hydrogen is generated or the different sources of hydrogen um, gain awareness on the safety and the risk aspects of hydrogen. And then I think on the last day, I may bring in things related to the cost of hydrogen as a fuel. A bit about my background or about me, if you are on LinkedIn, you can find me on LinkedIn. And this is what you will see on my LinkedIn homepage. So I'm currently an assistant professor at Texas A&M University. I teach a lot about low carbon energy technologies, carbon storage, hydrogen, geothermal energy, and things like that. I have um, a PhD from Stanford University on energy resources engineering, and my BEng and master's were in University of Port Harcourt. I combine what I teach with industry experience. I have about 15 years of experience in the oil and gas industry, but I am very much focused on sustainability right now. Um, for those who know what numerical modeling is, I do a lot of modeling of the subsurface. So I try to understand what's going on on the ground and how we can use that for energy storage or for sustainability. And so when I teach, I teach based on the fundamental principles, but I combine it with research and my industry experience. And I hope that over the next um, couple of days, you will be um, enriched by what you will learn from this course. So let's start um, day one. We're going to start with introductory concepts to on hydrogen. So why is there a, some kind of interest in hydrogen? Hydrogen has always been there, but there is some um, growing interest. So on the figure you're seeing on the left, it's looking at how our energy mix has evolved over time, starting with when we had basic traditional biomass like the firewood, and then the coming in of coal, oil, natural gas, um, nuclear and renewables. So over time, our energy mix has been evolving. We have been incorporating different energy resources into our energy mix. And that has been happening for um, over the years, as you can see. Now, this additional figure that I show is given the projections of uh, energy sources into the next, let's say, 20 years or, or, or so. Now, we all we make projections, but things could change, okay? But we'll start with what we have now. And one of the things we can see is that the green line, which is other renewable energies are growing, 
There's also going to be this growth in natural gas, petroleum and other liquids, and this decline in coal. And there is a reason for that, for this kind of projection we're seeing. The reason for that is basically because the, the energy mix currently is being driven by, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So before now, the energy mix we were seeing were due to scarcity. So if, for instance, there was no oil, people would resort to using gas. Or if there was no coal, they would resort to using oil. So, or if the price of one of these fuels were very high, they switched to the other one. Those were the drivers in the past. But moving forward, there is this need for sustainability to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so we see things like renewable energy increasing. We see things like natural gas increasing. And the reason why natural gas is increasing over coal is because natural gas has what we call a lower um, CO2 or greenhouse gas intensity. And I'm going to define some of these terms as we move forward. So just to iterate the last point, the current energy mix is driven by the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So if you see GHG, that means greenhouse gas. And then utilize energy resources with minimal environmental and social impact. So to understand more the, en the um, emissions landscape, we need to look at where are we getting emissions from? And there are different sectors where we get emissions. So globally, we see that we have the industries, we have electricity, that means of generating electricity. You can see coal, natural gas, and oil, um, agricultural land use and waste, transport and buildings. And the reason why I'm sharing this is when we start going into the hydrogen economy, I want you to be thinking of how can hydrogen fit into any of these places to reduce the kind of, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, okay? So um, that's what I will say. And then um, one of the key takeaways from this slide is that the industry and electricity generation, they take or cost more than half of the global emissions. So I see a hand raised. Do you have a question? You can type your questions in the Q&A session and I'll be able to address it. So pathways to decarbonization. So when we talk about decarbonization, we're basically saying, how do we remove carbon from certain processes? So now remember that we identified in the previous slide, the different sectors in which we generate greenhouse gas emissions. And decarbonization, even though it's talking about carbon, it usually tries to envelope the greenhouse gas emissions as well. And so here I list or summarize different types, which is, um, first of all, energy efficiency and conservation. So what do we mean by this? If you have, for instance, um, a building where all through, the, all through the day and night, the lights and the bulbs are on, you're going to be utilizing electricity. Um, and let's say your source of electricity is natural gas that generates CO2 emission. If you then reduce the amount of light bulbs you have on, which is conservation of energy, you're going to reduce the amount of power requirement and hence reduce your amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, another example could be if you have a um, let's say a washing machine and a dryer that uses a certain amount of, of um, energy. And then later on, you decide to get a washing machine and drying machine that utilizes less energy. In that case, you know, we have an appliance that is energy efficient. And so it's going to help to reduce the amount of power requirement. So there are certain bulbs that you can put in your house 
on your buildings that take less power than conventional bulbs. So those are those are one of the ways. The second way is electrification. So you look at different processes and say, can I replace the use of you know, this fossil fuel or this other energy source with electricity. And a good example will be in the transportation sector where there's something like electric cars. So what it basically means is that instead of the cars to be using diesel or fossil fuel, the electric cars use electricity. And when, and the generation of this electricity, it does not give out CO2 emissions. Then changes in land use, because things like frequent felling of trees, cutting down of trees, we have CO2 that is usually stored in these plants that are immediately released to the environment. So these things cause release of CO2. Now, if we reduce the frequency of cutting down of these trees, we would reduce this um, amount of CO2 in the environment. Then afforestation means growing back of trees, building back these trees. And because we know that plants utilize CO2 for photosynthesis, therefore they will be able to extract CO2 from the environment. Similarly, improved um, grazing management. So instead of having the cows to graze out you know, all the grasses and those plants, we develop strategies in which we do not completely clear out lands so that we have greens that are able to um, absorb or taking CO2. Now we have other technologies where we capture CO2 when they are emitted or capture CO2 from some areas that already have it. And so if we are collecting CO2 directly from the air, because this CO2 is has been you know, sent into the air, we will collect it, call, um, call it direct air capture. So if you see an acronym called DAC, D-A-C, that is talking about direct air capture. Now, the way power plants are designed, as they burn the fuel, they release CO2. And so if we put in some processes within our power plants that enable us to collect that CO2, or the CO2 we collected from what we call flue gas, the effluent gas that generated as a result of combusting the fuel, then we have a carbon capture technology. So we've captured it. Then we have to think about when we've captured it, what are we going to do with it? We don't want to release it back into the atmosphere. So we, we either decide to utilize it for certain processes that already utilize carbon, CO2, or we store it in different locations, preferably on the ground, so that it doesn't have access back into the atmosphere. And this should be done in a safe way to ensure that we do not impact the subsurface. And then finally, we have fuel switching. Fuel switching means if I have a source that I'm using a particular fuel, so let's say it's a power plant based on coal, and I decide to replace my power plant, my coal power plant with a gas powered um, power plant, then I am bringing in a new fuel that reduces the carbon intensity or the greenhouse gas intensity. I could go to another process and decide that instead of using a natural gas plant, I want to use solar or wind. And so I'm even more and more reducing the carbon intensity by introducing this low carbon or zero carbon emitting sources. So this is where hydrogen fits in. Hydrogen, comes in as a fuel switching, um, under the fuel switching category. We use it in several ways, which we'll talk about, but there are certain processes in which we can replace the use of natural gas with hydrogen. And this is some of the things we're going to be looking at in, throughout this week. So when we talk about hydrogen and the hydrogen economy, what we're basically trying to say is we want to use hydrogen to replace different sectors, as we saw, in order to reduce carbon emission. So a hydrogen economy is saying, I'm going to go into my industry, go into my electricity, 
go into my um let's say steel making um industry just going to serve up my transportation sector and replace whatever fossil fuel i'm using with hydrogen so that's basically what a hydrogen economy is looking at so the applications include traditional fuel usage using electricity generation in transportation and in other industrial and manufacturing process so why hydrogen why couldn't we think of any other gas why hydrogen okay so hydrogen first of all is the most abundant element in the universe and it is it has um, substantial quantities available on it we see it combined most of the time but we also have free hydrogen in some cases and most of it is in the form of water or organic compounds there's something very unique about hydrogen it carries a very high energy content by weight which means if I bring one kg of hydrogen and compare it to one kg of another gas, let's say methane, the energy content in that hydrogen is much higher than the energy content in the methane. However, we're going to see that there's another definition which we have called the energy content by volume. And we're going to see how hydrogen's energy content by volume looks like. Now, if we take um, hydrogen and it goes through combustion, that is reacting with oxygen, it does not yield any particulate emissions, which are the, you know sulfur oxide, nitrogen oxide, or carbon dioxide. Okay, unlike natural gas or coal, if we take it through the process of combustion, we will have CO, CO, carbon monoxide, CO two. We would have um, so so something nox so the sox and the nox we would have all these things and so these are the things we avoid by using hydrogen hydrogen can integrate with our current and future renewable energy markets so hydrogen is also what we call an energy carrier and i'm going to define it soon it basically means that you know if we have solar energy or wind energy or geothermal energy we can actually combine it and convert it to hydrogen and later on when we need that energy back we take the hydrogen and convert to energy so it helps us to integrate with our renewable energy market because sometimes our energy system is such that we have excesses and then we have deficits and so we want to take advantage of the excesses to be able to um, supply energy when we have a deficit. And then beyond energy, hydrogen is used as a feedstock for various consumer applications. So I've been discussing a couple of things. I want to um, pause and ask if there's any questions, please put them on the Q&A so that I could address them. Okay, no questions. Okay, good. All right, so let's go into definitions of some key terms. So what is hydrogen? We've been talking about hydrogen, but what is it? So it's a chemical element with the symbol H and atomic number one. So for everyone that did chemistry, you would know what hydrogen is on the periodic table. It's the lightest and most abundant element in the universe. It is also considered a clean energy carrier that can be used for fuel, storage, and various processes. Now, what is energy? What are we talking about? Energy is that ability to do work. We would measure it in units like joules, kilowatt hour, or BTU, and they all have different ways in which we could scale this unit. So you hear kilojoules, megajoules, kilowatt hour, megawatt hour, and things like that. 
So this is just the ability to do work, okay? So it's, you know, when we talk about potential energy and um, kinetic energy and all those things, that's the ability or capacity to do work, okay? So there's a question here that is asking, is hydrogen used as a liquid or gas? And so the answer is you can use it in either form. It depends on what the application is going to be. Now, uh, when we go into tomorrow, when we look at, no, not tomorrow, when we're looking at storage and transportation, we're going to look at the different forms in which we store and transport hydrogen and the implications of the different you know, temperatures and pressures at which we're going to store and transport hydrogen. Okay. Now, power. Power is the rate at, of which we do work. So if you have energy over time, that is your power, okay? So now the units of power will be joules per second, Units of um, power could be me uh, watts, megawatts for larger quantities. Renewable energy, uh, energy from renewable sources like wind, solar, geothermal, hydropower, and various forms of biomass. They are considered renewable because they are continually replenished on the earth. The greenhouse gases, these are gases that trap heat in the atmosphere and cause the greenhouse gas effect. Now, we have lived with the greenhouse gas effect for a long time. It has been there, it's part of our system, but you know the issue now is that the effect is getting much more than was originally anticipated. So that's why it's something that is being looked into. So some of the greenhouse gases are CO2, which is carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor, which has always been there, and some fluorinated gases, which we use in our refrigerants. When we talk about net zero emissions, we are talking about achieving an overall balance between the greenhouse gases that are produced and the ones that are taken out of the atmosphere. So if you have a system that generates greenhouse gases, let me say it is 1 million tons of greenhouse gases by mass. And you have another system that is able to take away the 1 million tons of CO2 of greenhouse gases, then your overall, your net balance is zero. And so we have net zero emissions. Now let's talk about energy density. So initially I said that the energy, the hydrogen has a very high energy stored in one kilogram of that substance of hydrogen. So that is called our gravimetric energy density. So it's the energy stored in the mass of the substance. We also have volumetric energy density, and that is energy stored per unit volume of that substance. So hydrogen has a very high gravimetric energy density, but because it has a low density, it has a very low volumetric energy density. So we're going to do an exercise, just see how that works, okay? And then energy carrier. An energy carrier is a substance or medium that can store, transport, and deliver energy. So what happens is hydrogen in its form, we get solar energy, wind, geothermal, whatever renewable, renewable energy it is, we convert it to hydrogen through processes like electrolysis. And in that, pro in that uh, form of hydrogen, we can store the hydrogen as a gas or a liquid or whichever form we want to store it, or even as another compound. And then later on, when we want to use that hydrogen, we can collect it. If we want to transport it and we feel that it's easier for us to transport hydrogen than transporting the solar energy, then we will use hydrogen in that form. So we would see as this goes when we talk about storage and transport. So what are key properties of hydrogen that I would like us to um, look at? On the, on the figure on, on the right, we see hydrogen on the periodic table. It's our number one 
um, element. It's colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless, and non-toxic. So colorless means we are not going to see it. Odorless means we're not going to smell it. Tasteless, we're not going to be able to fit, taste anything in our mouth. And it's non-toxic in where it is. However, it is highly combustible. So when it comes in contact with oxygen, we should be expecting some combustion. It has low density, which is what I talked about when we're talking about the volumetric energy and also low viscosity. You know, so it's very mobile. It diffuses. It you know, it gets into. It can move very easily. Okay. It has a high gravimetric energy density, but a relatively low volumetric energy density. Okay. Pure hydro, um, hydrogen um, flames due to combustion um, are nearly invisible, almost invisible to the naked eye. So it means that if we have hydrogen burning, we may not be able to see it. And that is yet another thing. It's a safety issue. We'll talk about it when we talk about risk and safety associated with hydrogen. One of the things that I would just put out here is um, when I when I teach, I really like my students to have access to where I can get properties of this fluids, thermophysical properties, in case there's need for calculations. And I put this link here. So at your spare time, feel free to go there and look at it. Um, and then you just basically choose the fluid you want this this NIST database has lots of properties of different fluids so for hydrogen you can always drop down and check the different um, properties based on temperature and pressure so if I want to know the density of hydrogen at a given temperature I will come here and fix that temperature and pressure and then I can check it at a different pressure and temperature so at your spare time feel free to use this I see a hand raised. Let me check if there's a question. Why does hydrogen have two positions on the um, periodic table? So no, it doesn't have two positions on the uh, periodic table. It has one position, that first point, but towards the left of the figure, okay, towards the left is kind of like an enlargement showing where the um, figure, well, what hydrogen is showing more of the properties. So that's what it's doing there. Um, basically, anything that is green means that it's a reactive substance. So hydrogen is also reactive, okay? Um, the second question is, uh, what are the risks associated with the use of hydrogen? I will leave that to the discussion on risk and safety, which is on our day four. But there are a couple of risks with hydrogen. <clears throat> and then how can we increase the energy density of hydrogen? So for us to increase the energy density of hydrogen means we need to increase the density of hydrogen itself. And so we are going to discuss more about that in um, storage, storage properties, okay? When we're looking at storage properties. Okay. So let's look at this. So these are different energy densities for um, hydrogen, okay? So we have um, for different fluids, we have the um, for hydrogen 141, methane 55.5, and ethane. So basically, we want to find what the volumetric energy density is for these different fluid fuels and talk about them. Okay. There's a hand raised. Um, do you have a question? Um, that is Mahmoud. Do you have a question? If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A session. Okay, so if we want to do this to kind of find what the volumetric energy density is, okay? 
we would need to get um, multiplied by the density of hydrogen, okay? So I'm writing on this times the density of methane and times the density of ethane. So what you can do is to go to something like the NISC database, or you can even ask Google, what is the density of hydrogen at standard temperature and pressure, which is surface um, for methane and for ethane, and you get some values, okay? So what I'm going to show is um, the results that I have. And so this is basically multiplying by 0 0.089, okay, kilograms per meter cubed for hydrogen, okay? So that will give you what the volumetric energy density is. For methane, you do the same thing. You use a density of about um, 0 0.71 or 0 0.72, something like that, kilograms per meter cube to get this value. And then for ethane, you'll be using something like 1.3 kilograms per meter cubed to be able to do that, okay? And you arrive at this value. So what you can see is that the volumetric energy density of hydrogen is quite low. And what does it really mean in terms of significance? Let's say you have a storage tank that can take only um, 40, that, that you know, it can take a certain volume, 40 meter cubes of a fluid or something like that. It means that for methane, maybe you will just put, um, you know, so if you fill that tank, 40 meter cubes, you'll be able to get about one megajoules of, of um, energy. If you fill this tank with um, the 40 meter cubes tank with um, hydrogen, okay, you would, that you would need a lot, first of all, a lot of volume to be able to get up to one megajoules. While for eating, you will need less, okay? So you need so much volume to be able to get one megajoules as compared to something like methane or even more for eating, okay? Okay, so I'm seeing questions related to safety. Again, safety will be discussed on the fourth day. It's part of the agenda, okay? Someone is asking about getting the lesson notes. The presentation is going, it's recorded, it's being recorded as we speak, and it's going to be available on YouTube. I'm also seeing a question related to hydrogen on the halogen group property, and that is one of the unique things about hydrogen it sits with the other um, groups in, even though it's a metal, even though it's reactive, it sits with the other ones on the periodic table. So it's something that is unique about hydrogen. Environmental impact. I'm not sure I'm covering the details of life cycle assessments and environmental impact, but it's something that I will touch on briefly on day four when we look about risk and safety of hydrogen. Okay, so let's go into um, the overall value chain for hydrogen, okay? So if the, nat the hydrogen is not natural hydrogen, which is hydrogen that we found in the subsurface, you know, then we would have to generate hydrogen from somewhere. So we can generate hydrogen from renewable energy sources, natural gas, fossil fuels, bioenergy, okay? So that's where the starting point for the hydrogen. 
then we need to take it through a conversion process. We're going to discuss all of that tomorrow when we look at um, NH sources of hydrogen, how it's produced and all of that. But it goes through different conversion processes where we take this energy source and we convert it using a method to hydrogen. When we convert it to hydrogen, we can store it, we can transport it, we can use it. What we're going to do today is to look in detail about the different uses of hydrogen, okay? Let's really see where does hydrogen fit in our hydrogen economy that allows us to, that would allow us to decarbonize different aspects of it, of the sector, of the different sectors. Is there a question? I see another hand raised again. Is there a question? Okay. All right, let's continue. So what are the current uses of hydrogen? Hydrogen, the use of hydrogen has grown since 1975 and it continues to rise. Currently, hydrogen is being supplied mostly by fossil fuels, okay? So that's mostly natural gas. But the process of generating the natural gas, uh, of the hydrogen from natural gas produces CO2, roughly 915 million tons of CO2 per year. And so this is something that also will make us look, when we talk about different production methods tomorrow, we're going to look at different colors of hydrogen and what each process means, what's like the carbon intensity of different processes, more or less, okay? But why are we producing this hydrogen? We're producing it because we want to use it, okay? So what are the uses of hydrogen? Oil refining, production of ammonia, and the ammonia is in turn used for fertilizer production, methanol, steel production, food processing, hydrogen fuel cells, heating, and power generation. And so if you cast your mind back to that image of, of um, the different sectors where we had um, greenhouse gas emissions, you can then begin to see where hydrogen fits in, okay? Hydrogen could fit into di different, this is the industry part, this is the power generation part, and in fuel cells is transportation part. Um, fertilizers, um, basically um, look, looking at the agricultural sector, okay? So let's go into oil refining. Now, if you don't have a chemical engineering background, don't panic with what's going on here. It's just showing us that hydrogen is used in a process. So we get this our uh, oil from the subsurface. You know, when we drill from for petroleum, we produce petroleum, but we don't use the petroleum raw by itself. We have to refine it into different products. And sometimes these oil we have could have sulfur or nitrogen and we don't want our products or the end use to have sulfur and nitrogen because when these things react with oxygen we have those NOx the particulate emissions SOx SOx NOx so those are particulate emissions and so because we want to be able to generate things like fuel that don't have this um, sulfur and nitrogen, we need to bring them out of the oil we're refining. And so in this particular case, if we have an oil that has um, sulfur in it, we um, combine it with hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst and very high temperatures to produce this gas, hydrogen sulfide, which we can later extract and treat and, and deal with separately. And then we have a, um, a desulfurized oil or desulfurized product. Similarly, we can do the same thing for a product with nitrogen. 
And here we're getting um, ammonia and a denitrogened product, okay? So about 75% of the hydrogen consumed worldwide is by refineries, um, consumed by refineries are produced from natural gas. And the process we'll see tomorrow um, produces CO2, okay? So this is what it basically is. We get uh, whatever our product is, we inject hydrogen, subject it to high um, pressures and temperature, mostly high temperatures, and then we separate we separate the, the substances, our desulfurized um, product from hydrogen, and later take this one for use. So this one is now the one we're going to use. Another place where we use hydrogen is in the production of ammonia, okay? And so the production of ammonia is also a chemical process. We have the Haber-Bosch process, which is combining nitrogen with hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst to generate ammonia. Now, this is a very um, interesting process because Ammonia itself has a high volumetric energy density compared to hydrogen. And so people are considering using ammonia as a way of transporting hydrogen. So this is something we'll discuss in detail in the storage and transport sector. But we know that this is a process that the industry is, you know, they are skilled in the Haber-Bosch process and you know, how to produce ammonia. Now, ammonia itself is used to make fertilizers, it's used to make explosives, fibers, plastics, and other pharmaceuticals. So it all starts with having hydrogen in the process, okay? Another use of hydrogen is in preparing methanol. Now, methanol is um, a very versatile, product used in different industries, can list all of them here, but it's um, the, the methanol and its derivative products, aesthetic acid and formaldehyde are used as base materials for acrylic, plastic, synthetic fabric, fibers to make clothing, adhesive paint, plywood. So it's used in many, many industries. So it can be formed either from natural gas or from syngas. Now, if we have to generate hydrogen, um, methanol from syngas, syngas involves the process of combining CO, carbon, carbon monoxide, with hydrogen, as we can see here. And so that would enable us to generate um, the methanol, okay? So this is where hydrogen comes in, in the production of methanol. So there's a question <clears throat> that says, how can we determine the amount or percentage of hyd hydrogen when it combines with other gases or air for combustion? So these are based on um, stoichiometry, you know. So if you have a reaction, H2 plus O2 will give you two H2O, okay? You know, how much one mole of hydrogen is, and then how much one mole of oxygen is that is giving you two moles of hydrogen, of water, H2O. So this is the way we use. We just have to, first of all, get the reaction, balance the chemical reaction, and then determine the amount based on the reaction, since we know what your molecular weights, molar mass are, okay? Um, I see a comment, it's not a question. It says hydrogen is used in petroleum uh, refining and production of ammonia and methanol is mainly produced by fossil fuels. Yes, that is correct. And um, we will be discussing the production of hydrogen tomorrow. Uh, and what I have mentioned that hydrogen, 75% of it, or even a great portion of it, today is being form, um, generated through um, natural gas, through the process of steam methane reforming, which we'll discuss tomorrow, to generate the hydrogen.
Um, the other thing I'll talk about is steel production. So um, we traditionally make steel from um, iron ore in a blast furnace. We have a lot of heat that we bring in. We try to melt our iron ore. And then once it's melted, we mix it with other materials to generate steel. Now, people have begun to think about, is there any way we can reduce the amount of energy we're using to generate this steel? Is there any other process? And so there is what we call direct reduced iron, which is where we reduce the iron ore itself using something like carbon monoxide and hydrogen. This carbon monoxide and hydrogen will be coming from, or the hydrogen will be coming from natural gas. So we use it to reduce the ion instead of actually um, trying to raise the temperature to heat the ion. And so this direct reduced ion is formed through, it's, we convert it into what we call a sponge ion. It's a metallic form of ion that can be processed to form steel. It's done at high temperatures but below the temperatures, the melting point of iron. And so because we do not have to melt the iron, we do not use as much energy as if as when we are doing it in the blast furnace and trying to melt the iron. So that's a way of reducing the amount of energy. It's like, in quote, energy conservation, in addition to fuel switching that we're trying to do in this particular case. So for those interested in the reaction of direct reduced ion, this is how it starts. You get your ion ore and you expose it to hydrogen and you will still get a product where you will need to expose it more and more to hydrogen until you finally arrive at ion and water. Then this ion is what goes and is mixed with the other materials to form steel. Hydrogenation is a process where we use hydrogen in the food, you know, we just tend to use hydrogen as a reducing agent in the presence of a catalyst such as nickel, palladium, or platinum. So we use it in the food industry for something as basic as creating uh, margarine and shortening. And this is what is shown in the figure that is here, okay? Um, so you basically use hydrogen as a reducing agent to be able to create from your oil, you create margarine, cream, and shortening. The other use of hydrogen is as a fuel cell. Now, basically, what happens is that we have a system where we bring in hydrogen, we combine it with oxygen, and we are able to generate electricity. The combination of hydrogen and oxygen in a chemical reaction is going to produce water and water is going to come out. But this process is going to enable us to generate electricity using the fuel cell. So I will discuss more about this when we're going to be looking at electrolysis and fuel cells because the parts are somewhat similar. So when I'm discussing electrolysis, I will go into details of fuel cell. Now we can use this fuel cell for electricity generation by itself, or we can use it in what we call fuel cell electric vehicles, where we take the fuel cell, put inside the vehicle, and then we make hydrogen combined with oxygen to generate electricity. And that electricity is what is going to drive the car. So this is like an EV car, an electric vehicle, but is driven by hydrogen. For heating, we take hydrogen and we use it, you know, inside boilers. So instead of the typical boilers that would use natural gas, we can use hydrogen in place of that gas. Remember that um, um, hydrogen has a high energy density, gravimetric energy density. So it's like replacing the boiler, but using hydrogen instead of natural gas. In other cases, you can use a fuel cell or you can use a hybrid system. In a hybrid system, you can be combining, let's say, your um, boiler or your fuel cell with what we call heat pumps from the geothermal sector or with solar energy 
so that you can reduce carbon intensities. But these, all of these are still in development and testing phases. In fact, um, there, are, um, there are studies that show that this is quite expensive. It's not only expensive, but energy intensive as well. So it is still on that research phase. And then the last um, use of hydrogen is for power generation. So that's basically generating electricity. So instead of using natural gas or coal, you're using hydrogen. So this would either be in a power plant, okay? And the figure you see on the right here is saying that if you have your hydrogen, that you've generated from, let's say, curtailed energy. So curtailed energy is like excess energy. You pass that excess energy through an electrolyzer, you get hydrogen. You can combine that hydrogen with your natural gas, blend them together and run a turbine, a, a power plant. So that would help to reduce the carbon intensity of the process. Um, this is what a turbine looks like just for, for you to know. So this is the part that actually the fluid or the gas that comes in, touches the blades, makes this um, blades rotate to generate electricity. The other figure you see here is basically a fuel cell plant. So this is a big fuel, scale plant, uh, fuel cell power plant that uses hydrogen combined with oxygen to generate electricity. And um, this is what we see. All right, uh, do you have any more, any questions for me? If you have questions, please put, um, um, put them in the chat box or right, the Q&A session. So I see a question, can we use um, nuclear magnetic reaction to get the percentage of hydrogen from other gases? So this is a technology, it's possible, and it's currently being um, investigated. So that is NMR technology. Yes, it's being investigated, um, especially on um, um, systems that, yeah, is systems where we do logging. People in petrophysics are investigating it. People on the lab scale are also investigating this. Okay, in the absence of any other questions, I will um, I will give you a short quiz before so close for today. So it will just be 10 um, true or false questions. So you can just do them. Um, I would have the record. I will send them to the organizer of this course because for each day you need to be able to get your I'm sure that you participated to get your certificate, okay? So I'm going to stop sharing this screen and share another screen. Okay. Okay. So for you to do this, um, type in the game pin on um, www.kahoot.it, type in the game pin, and then we could always start.
Okay, I we are um almost out of time. I will just give us one more minute and then I will set the questions up. Um yeah. So I'll just give us one more minute, okay? And because it's recorded, I may not um, show the answers to the questions yet because other people will still take the questions, the same quiz um, offline, okay? All right, let me start. So the current evolving mix is due to scarcity of fuels. Oops, no finding so. Okay, and so, okay. All right. Sorry, I have to stop sharing. Okay, and when I read, you will get the questions. I'll read out the questions to you and you will, um, okay. So the next question, it's true or false. You have just 10 seconds. Industry and electric power generate more than half of global emissions, true or false. Industry and electric power generates more than half of global emissions, okay. Third question, fuel switching is a decarbonization pathway. Next question, hydrogen carries an exceptionally high energy content by volume. Hydrogen carries a high energy content by volume. Okay. Hydrogen is colorless, odorless, tasteless, and non-toxic. Hydrogen is colorless, odorless, tasteless, and non-toxic. Hydrogen is used in the Haber-Bosch process. Hydrogen is used in the Haber-Bosch process. Current production of hydrogen does not yield any CO2 emissions. Current production of hydrogen does not yield any CO2 emissions. Hydrogenation does not use catalyst. Hydrogenation does not use catalyst. Hydrogen can be used for heating. Hydrogen can be used for heating. That seems to be the simplest question. And the last question, 
Fuel cells produce hydrogen and oxygen. Fuel cells produce hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to share the podium, that's all. And the questions are going to be put on um, a Google Sheet so that you people can, if you want to do it again, you can. Okay. okay. So these are your top three for today. All right. Are there any more questions for me? I have to close now. Okay. The question is green hydrogen, the future energy. Um, we are still looking at different aspects of green hydrogen. We are looking at um, the cost. We are looking at um, the life cycle emissions. And we are looking at, you know, the whole process, if we can scale up. So for now, I cannot give a definite answer, but this is currently being um, on research. One day, I'm sorry, I didn't know that you didn't have access to the game pin, but the questions will be posted on, on Google Sheets somewhere and you could do the, do the um, quiz. And the last comment was thank you. So um, this is just to say um, thank you for today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.